So, has anyone here ever been to a uh, recording session, like a, done a jingle session or anything like that? Yeah. Did you ever get asked, oh, quartet's finished, can the viola player just stay behind? We just wanted you to make up a few bits, right? And this used to happen to me in my quartets in Melbourne where I, where I was um, trained in, in the early stages of my life. And we'd just freeze because as the classic line, the classic comeback line to, can you just improvise something at the end of the, at the, end of the piece was, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. That was the, that was the, the freeze frame that lasted until we went home. And um, I had some uh, great experiences which led me into being able to improvise. I won't go into all that now. But what I found was there's actually lots of things we can do so that we can feel as comfortable improvising as we do when we've got a score on the stand. And come in, come in, maybe there's still some chairs. I think. <laughs> there's one in the middle there as well. Yeah. Maybe move along, yeah, that'd be great. Right. So, what I discovered was, as I, as I was improvising, um, that there's four things that really make music tick when we're improvising. And they, the first thing that lands us from not knowing what to do is what notes are we going to use. So it could be a scale, it could be an arpeggio, it could be something really weird that we've concocted of our own, but we need to know, or, we, or it's completely free tonality, but we need to know what, uh, to give ourselves the confidence just to let go, we need to know what bunch of notes or what, what I call the tonality of the music. So there's these four parameters that I use. First, the first parameter of, of music, um, as I see it in all time, in all cultures, in all planets, is the tonality. What tonality are we using? Are we using a, a, a major kind of sound, a major scale? Are we using a minor scale? Are we using some kind of um, altered scale? Are we using a pentatonic scale? And each of these opens up a whole lot of possibilities. Because if I play something... If I change... That's in D major. If I change to one of the modes, the Lydian mode, which has got the raised fourth. Have a listen. Virtually the same phrase, just with the G sharp. So there's the D major. So for me, what's really important is not learning a whole lot of scales and just going, yeah, I mean, A, A major, and just roaring out notes. It's about the emotional meaning of the music every time we change from major to minor or from using the altered scales where we have these weird notes from the modes put in like the, the, the Lydian mode there where we have the G sharp. So um, this is the first thing that we start to look at is, well, What's my bunch of notes going to be? It could be a pentatonic scale. Okay. Pentatonic scale. It could be free tonality. There's no, is that major, is it minor? It's, it's, it's neither, it's, it's just a freely chosen notes. So there's not really any limit to what we can do, but just having that decision, oh, I'm going to play in a free tonality, we can put a lot of energy and ideas and imagination into it that if we're one worried about what we should be doing, 
it's not possible. So I'd like to um, invite the people who've got their instruments here. Um, come and have a seat. Can Perfect. Have a front row. Come right on in. You've got one. Join in. Um, <coughs> just get, get your instruments. Can we move? Oh, it's pretty cramped. But yeah. Is that a no, you don't need electric for this part. Bit. This is all acoustic. This. this is just about the improvisation. <laughs> I'll squish oh, there this. There you go, you've got the chair. Okay. Um. Holding pitch. I know. <laughs> I might have had to so, it 50 times. Okay, so what I want you to do, I'm just going to play an ostinato figure, and I just want you to have a quick turn each of playing something, just a few bars in D major. So I'm going to be doing this. Imagine it was like a, a Schubert quint quartet. Something like that, but it's going to be a duet because I'm just going to play with <laughs> So I'm going to be going. Right. Easy enough. But if you didn't know that we were going to be in D, how, how, how would you go improvising? So the whole thing is I've made it so simple for us by just saying, well, we're in, yeah, sure. Okay, great. Um, what about our lovely viola over there? <laughs> so I'm gonna do exactly the same thing. Sake, I'm going to change into the Lydian mode for our next people. So it's a D major scale with a G sharp, so it's actually the key signature of A major, but it's very strongly rooted on a D. So, okay, here we go. So I'm going to do the same thing. Just to a slightly different place, just that one, that one note change. Go, have a go. Sure. So Lydian scale, but the key of it looks like an A major key signature, but it's actually playing on D. young gentleman I'm going to change to D minor do you know any do you know the D minor key signature okay I'll show you the notes I'm going to do a D natural minor so it's D E F natural G A B flat C not C sharp it's not the harmonic or the melodic it's just the natural minor so it's just the B flat everything else is natural Okay, do you want to play through the scale with me just for a sec? B flat, C natural. So it's like the descending melodic minor, but you go up and down the same. All right, so I'm going to play a similar thing, and you can just have a bit of a play with that scale. But it, 
with the change of notes again, have a listen to have a listen to how different this feels. interchangeable pieces of music from what we heard with the D major or the, the, the Lydian or, or this natural minor or Aeolian mode as it's called. Would you like to have a go? Thank you very much. That was, that was lovely. things are going. It's actually, did anybody find that particularly difficult? No? It's pretty easy. So by setting, by setting the tone, by setting the scene of what we're doing, which we're doing just by choosing a scale, we're opening a door that we can walk through with a fair amount of confidence. Thank you. Very nice. All of you actually, it was really, really sensitive. Thank you. Um, what's your name? Michael. Michael. I'd like to join. Same thing. Stage me. No, exactly. She's got a bigger pedal board than I have. <laughs> so I've already got a bit Wait nervous. A with it's that. his fault. I encouraged her. No, you've, got the, you've got the uh, pitchfork on. Oh, is it? Oh, God. I was trying to work out which one. Yeah. Same thing, Karen. <laughs> yep. This is Karen Griffin. Here we go. So you just keep using the same I am notes of the for this demonstration of, of the the AOM. I have a string. I for a long period in Europe, I had it around 2004 to 2009. I had a string quartet based in Milan, and we would get together. Two of us were living in Austria, and two were living in Milan, uh, playing in La Scala, and we I'd take them on a sort of workshop weekend, teaching them this improvisation approach. And we would get together and do whole string quartets for hours like this. And mm. there's no way we stuck to to plan like that, but it, it, these give us starting points, they're entry points, and they're really helpful if you're yeah. improvising with other people on your own, obviously you can do whatever takes your fancy in that moment, a little harder to make it sound good, and with a quartet or a duet or a trio, if nobody knows what others are doing. So this is a sort of fast track, a simple way to get everyone on the same page. And of course, you know, I actually modulated through A, a major chords, all yeah, sorts of things there. But um, the point is that just using the notes from that scale, suddenly we can join in and make music. And it could be a, a, could be a, 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 a Turkish um, flute player and, a, and you, or, or 
or a, an Indian sitar player, but we'd find common scale and then we can start to make music together. That's all we need is that. So, the second thing that I use in the improvisation, there's the tonality is the first thing. The second kind of, oh, by the way, the tonality reel boils down to two things, major or minor. All the modes, all the scales that, in the end, they're either major or minor. Pre-tonality is a bit harder to pin down, but rules are always incomplete. So, as a general rule, for your tonality, um, you're looking at major or minor. Uh, remember, this is a very quick overview. I normally do this over a two-day workshop. <laughs> so, the next thing is how it moves. And you notice there, I chose a kind of a kind of gentle andante kind of pace with that, and it was a uh, it was in four. I could have been in three. Um, the next thing is how it moves, and how it moves, it either moves quickly or it moves slowly, doesn't it? M music's either fast or slow, or in the middle, or really slow or really fast. And it either moves in two, or some multiple of two, like four or eight, or it moves in threes, or multiples of threes, or some combination. So basically, in terms of what I call the metrical side, or the, I like to call it the meter, the second parameter, it's the meter of the music that covers tempo, it covers kick time signatures, it covers accents, rhythms, whether we're just doing something like a drone, or whether we're going, whether it's very rhythmic, um, very jagged accents, this kind of thing. Um, this gives the music a whole other shape, right? Because if we do exactly the same scales and exactly the same um, tonality, and we change the rhythm around, it's going to be unrecognizable. So let's do that. Let's start with you guys. We'll work back. Any questions so far? Okay. okay. So, D major scale, but I'm going to give it a, a pretty uh, a choppy rhythm. So it's going to be. Um, into, depending on how the soloist plays, it could go down a classical road, it could go down some other roads, and Karen very skillfully took that into a kind of slightly jazzy feel there, but it doesn't have to be. It could be, so can you play something really, yeah. really straight? Like yeah, okay. So. Really, um, mm, let's take something else. Um, something a little 20th century American it's tonal. <laughs> There's a whole, there's a whole years of exploring what happens when you do, you know, tight little clusters of notes like that, or you do them really spread out. So that's a whole other story. <laughs> but you get the idea. Tonality gives us a doorway in that we can participate because we know what the notes are. The rhythm starts to tell us how it has to move, and they would have responded very differently if I'd done something like. There's no way. <laughs> so the rhythm is a, the metrical side. Of <laughs> That's not fair. <laughs> That's pre-prepared. <laughs> there's 
the, the, the meter really is a powerful driver in the music. You can see this already. So whether we do things in three, I mean the obvious one. Um, yeah, so it would be a waltz, etc. I'm not going to get through everyone with everything or we're going to be here for a couple of days. Um, the next thing which we just started to touch on, the third parameter, is the style. I don't mean like flashy clothes. <laughs> I mean the style of the music that we're playing. Because we talk about um, period style playing in Baroque, don't we? In Baroque music, the whole movement over the last 40 years of people actually um, realizing how differently the Baroque period played their instruments and their whole approach to music and the sensibilities of it. And, and the little idiosyncrasies of that, that period of playing the best we can find now through the text, etc., and the illustrations. So the, the style is hugely important because I tied Karen back to something a bit more class, 20th century American classical. She did something very different from when I let her go off on a longer leash with uh, jazz, you see. So already the style is starting to really dictate a very different way of playing if we change it. Let me give you an example. Um, did you watch Kung Fu Panda? Okay. <laughs> Here's a scale for you. Okay. D, F, natural, G. A, C, natural, D. I play that at a school, everyone's going, Mr. Gunter, Mr. Gunter, Kung Fu Panda. Because, <laughs> why? Because I'm using a, pentaton a minor pentatonic scale. It's that simple. So I use a minor pentatonic scale, but the way we're playing it, would you like to have a little play with that, making it sound a bit like the music, the, the Chinese influence on this, the Kung Fu Panda soundtrack? And I'm just going to play some, I'm going to play a drone. same scale and I go influences come under style. So we've got we've got the time track we can talk about um, if I'm going to do an accompaniment like this. Something a bit more of the medieval style of, of accompaniment that was at the time through to anyone played second violin in Mozart quartets, right? <laughs> Through to um, what's an example of that? Kind of more twentieth century Stravinsky, Stravinsky's use of rhythms, etc. But it's a style; it's a recognisable style. It's a twenty twentieth century, and specifically in that Russian direction. So we can take it as a timeline thing, but we can also take it what like we did there. Um, something that's got a more Asian influence, something that's got a more North American, um, Afro-American blues um, origin to it. So in a cl strictly classical context, we could say, well, with the first piece we did today, we were aiming at, it doesn't matter whether we achieved it uh, scholastically or not, but we aimed in the direction of like a Schubert quartet, just this gentle kind of um, ostinato with a, with a sensitive melody over the top. Um, we could say, um, here's an example. Mm 
Argentinian tango. So all of these different things go into the mix. So the style, as you saw with the same scale, from a, a, a drone through to a blues accompaniment, is that a very, very powerful driver again. So we've got the tonality, major, minor, or any scales we want, or free tonality. We've got the whole metrical thing of how the music moves. And we've got the whole... <laughs> I knew there was a reason for those things. He wherever he goes, I've seen it before. So, and the third thing... The third, the third thing is... Is, is that that of, that of style? Whether it's you know you know. If you want a quick example of that, uh, Barbara, can I use you again? Um, if you take a what's an easy one for you? A C, a C minor. Um, what would it be? A C melodic uh, C melodic minor. Uh, the the descending pattern. So it's it's got the it's got the beat. It's got the raised seventh and the sixth. Uh, sorry, the ascending pattern. I mean, yeah, the ascending pattern, but use it up and down. So yeah. Now, if you me start messing around with the intention of sounding a bit like Bach with that, it's a really good scale because... playing a bit like Bach, yeah. we're not trying to say it is Bach or that it's competing with Bach, but it gives us a direction on the compass. If we're going to go on a holiday in the car for a week and we just go, okay, let's just drive somewhere, we've got to make some choice. We've got to go either go north, south, east or west or some, something. So by dialing up a composer's influence or an epoch in history, in musical history, as a, as a stylistic parameter, it starts to give our music direction and body <coughs> and intention that all those years of practicing and working in orchestras and playing concerts and sonatas, we've got all that stored inside us. So what I'm trying to show you here is that as classical musicians, you've already got everything you need mm -hmm. to improvise because you know the nuance of all that music. Mm -hmm. You know how Bach kind of sounds. You know how Stravinsky or... Tchaikovsky or Elbenberg or any of the great composers, you know what's involved in that. So you can reach in that direction. You don't have to study it. You don't have to make all the bars, the chord progressions correct. With 21st century, we can pretty well do what we like. But it gives you different directions. And so here's where you start to think about concert programs. If, even if you use the same scale and you use different time signatures and tempos and rhythms and things, you could probably do a scale just using a D major, a concept doing it, using a D major scale alone. It mightn't be quite as interesting, but you see, change it stylistically from blues to, to Turkish music influences to a bit like as much as you could, hard, Elben Berg, but you get the idea. They're just compass points that we can head for and start to give our music direction. Because the big thing that puts people off, they hear about improvisation, mostly, it's pretty bad, and it's usually the main thing that makes improvisation uninteresting is its directionlessness. This is how we give our music meaning and direction. So important. I wouldn't. I give for the last 17 years. I've given solo recitals all over the world. I've recorded for the ABC multiple times, and I never thought that the audience or the the, the CD should be anything less interesting than anything you bought off the shelf from a classical composer who knew what they were doing, writing down all the notes and then playing it. So there's no way that improvisation should be what someone said, oh yeah, it's more interesting to play than to do than to listen to. <laughs> and we've got a, a reason why that's been the case and we've got to have a, an approach that you can actually give it the direction and meaning. You can give it the integrity because you bring all of that sensitivity. 
it's not just improvisation for me has never been just playing without a music stand I'm just playing free notes yeah you know it's it's not about that it's about it's about love stories your every piece of music every note you play is a word in a love letter it's really that it's that personal and when you give yourself the space to do that that's when it starts to really come alive any questions before I go fourth parameter so tonality meter style ambience or feeling or the story of the music and this is probably the most well it is the most important one I've left it last just to give you some musical structure the most important thing you'll ever do with your improvisation is to have a story or an intention you've got to know who you're writing that love letter to and what you're trying to say because uh -uh. If I want to do a piece about um, a beautiful old dead tree out in a paddock near where I live up in the Shire of Wanneroo up near Yanchet, I'm um, going to do free tonality here just for fun. And I'm imagining all those dry grey sort of sticks against the sky. starting point because I wouldn't do that if I was sitting down by the by the by the river I would probably do something very very different so this is where we start to play river music or dead tree music or it could be a love letter to someone you know there's no reason why you can't because as soon as you have that it's like a scene in a movie <coughs> there's things that are going to fit and there's things that really aren't going to fit okay when we text people messages you get a text message saying you know, please come home, your, um, I don't know, your pet's died. Pet's just died, I'm sorry if that's happened to anyone recently, I don't mean any offence. That's different from saying, come home, um, your uncle's dropped in from England and he's got a new bike for you or something. But we register those things very differently, don't we? We register the messages. So our music is like sending text messages. It's like sending messages and we mean it. And that comes across. So um, I'll just do a quick one. Uh, you two, violin, viola, and then I'll move on to the electric stuff. At the same time? Yeah, together. <laughs> um, I want to do um, free tonality. So don't be shy. Any notes go. Um, it's more how you play them. All right. I want to do the. I want to do the pet dying. <laughs> so this is the text yeah, exactly. message about the pet. Free tonality, but I'm going to give it a pulse. It's going to be like a slowish sort of pulse I'll play with you. change to the new bicycle. <laughs> Same thing. <laughs> overview like skimming through the chapter titles of how I approach improvisation 
And I hope you all realize that that's exactly what all the composers have always done. Mm -hmm. Key signature, time signature, some little instruction like dolce mm -hmm. or pesante or something. And then the music itself. You know, we wouldn't dream of playing um, the Moonlight Sonata on the piano um, with a really heavy-handed sort of approach. We wouldn't do that because the feeling of the music, the story of what that sonata and where it goes or the, the bar kind of company suites for cello or whatever, we just wouldn't do that. So <clears throat> I encourage you all to go explore, um, to write down lots of ideas that you might have to try out, you know, um, different scales. I have a working repertoire of about 32, 35 scales that I just use every week. <clears throat> you probably have three or four. And it's just, go explore all the modes, again, it's a workshop, all the modes, and there's a lot more modes than they tell you. Um, <laughs> there's all the scales, there's all the synthetic scales, there's the four different sorts of pentatonic scales at least, there's the whole tone scales, there's half tone, whole tone, or octatonic scales, um, whole tone, half tone, etc. There's a lot of, there's a lot of things we can tweak those dials for each parameter to create, well I haven't run out and it's been 17 years and 27 albums, so it's, it's um, something that I hope you'll really take away today that you can keep exploring that really for the rest of your life. It took me about 20 years to sort all that out. <laughs> um, so he heads up, there you go, heads up. If you're looking for a primer for some of those unusual scales, um, there's a new publication called Accidentals Happen. Oh, nice. And there are versions of it in one octave, two octave, and three octave scales. Yeah. But it incorporates a lot of these unusual modes in the blues and all great, that. Great, great. So Thank you. Thanks, Ruth. You've got a good reference. Now, electric. <laughs>